Welcome to Find Me in a Book. This podcast is meant to be like you're talking to your best friend about romance books. I share my passion with those who love to read, those who don't have time to read, or those that don't like to read, but still want to know and be involved with book conversations. Thank you for being here. Let's get started. Hi, welcome back to another episode. Do I have an episode for you? Do I, uh, these books, I am so, I don't even know how to describe it. I'm so pleasantly, actually, I don't think pleasantly is even the word. I am so shocked and uh, speechless, except for I'm not speechless because I'm going to tell you all about it in this episode. I am just kind of flabbergasted on how I feel about these books in a good way. It's uh, obviously if it's making to it to the podcast as an episode, then you know that I liked it. I mean, at least a little bit, you know what I'm saying? Okay, I'm just going to jump right in because honestly, my TBR hasn't changed. And if it has, it it moves all the time because obviously this one, like this series, caught me off guard. Um, it was never on my TBR. I didn't even know about it until like a week ago because um, I made a new friend. And of course, when I make a new friend and we talk about books, I'm immediately going to ask them, okay, like what kind of books do you like? Um, and what are some suggestions? And you know how I feel about dark romances. I was very hesitant, but they were saying how good it was. And I'm willing to try. You guys know that I'm willing to try if someone is that passionate about a certain book or series or genre. Like, I will try it. So they told me this series um, by JT uh, Gessinger, I think that's how you say it. Um, it's the Queens and Monsters series. There's four books so far. And I think they were released on Kindle on November 30th, uh, November 30th of 2023. So I don't know when they were actually like formed or created or wrote, you know what I'm saying? Just that they were released, um, on that date on Amazon. I, I think the first one was maybe 2021 and then they came from there. So I didn't really look into it, but I did see that each of the books had over 20,000 reviews and they were all like, there was like more than four and a half stars on these books. Like that's how good they are. And I was like, okay, if they have that many reviews, if this friend is raving about it this much, like I need to see what's up. Like I need to see what's, what it's about And so we have the four books, Ruthless Creatures, Carnal Urges, Savage Hearts, and Brutal Vows. And these are dark romances. These are about the mafia, and they're spicy. And I knew that going in, and I was like, okay, I'm just going to keep an open mind. Like, I I try my best to keep an open mind. And so I read the first book, which we're going to talk about, and I couldn't stop. I was like, I am invested. Like, I want to know about these characters. And, like, it's not even that the first, like, the two characters in the first book, it's not like it's a continuation of their story in the second book. Like, it kind of is, but they're background characters in the second book. And then there's two other characters that it's their book on the second the second book. You know what I'm saying? Like it's their story. And then in the third book, it's two other characters, but still there's so much of these other characters in these books as well. So you still like follow along with their stories, but you learn about these other people's stories and like a continuation of it all. And there's like this big plot in the background that's happening and you just become so invested. And honestly, the second book is my favorite so far, which we will talk about why it's my favorite. I did enjoy the first one and I'm glad that I kept reading because there was a moment where I was like, do I want to keep reading? Like, I don't know, but there was just such a, a hook at the end because, um, the, the main female character in the second book is the best friend of the main female character in the first book. And I loved this character throughout the first book, like the best friend. I loved when she like made her appearances. She was spunky. She was witty. She was funny. I loved her. And then at the very end, there's like this little cliffhanger. And then 
I was like, oh my gosh, well, I, I need to know her story now. And I, I am for real when I say that it is 916 on Monday night, like PM. I started the, the first book last night at 8 PM. So I read the first book, the second book, and I am 65% the way through the third book to like already. And it's like 24 hours later. That's how fast I became hooked. Like, I'm not even joking. Um, I have been constantly reading um, the past 24 hours because I am just so invested with these people and this writing. And I I get it. Like, I understand why there are so many reviews because it, it's so good. So I'm going to tell you about the first um, I'm going to tell you about the first two books and then half of the third book, just because I am only halfway through it. And I will let you know when there are going to be some spoilers. I mean, there it's all going to kind of be spoilers, but there are some twists in these books that I, I will warn you about before I tell you, just in case that you do want to read them. Um, so like I said, over 20,000 reviews per book. I'm not even joking, per book. And the thing about books that are about like mobsters like they're bad guys but yet they have good guy qualities it's so like it's so hard to know like okay do I actually like them but they're doing these bad things but they're doing these bad things to bad people it's just such a a mind like it just boggles me like I don't I don't know how I should feel and so I just I get so confused (laughs) And so I just kind of turn off my humanity and I'm like, okay, this is just a really good book. And they are, they're so good. The characters are so good. One thing that I will say going into it though, is that we don't learn a lot of in-depth about these characters until like the very end, honestly. But it isn't all about like the sex or like all that. It's not about that. Like honestly, in these books, they don't have sex until like, And I usually say toast, but I think I'm growing up. I think I I think I can say sex now. Um, But they aren't doing that until like at least 50 percent the way through the book, which a lot of these books are just so spicy and smutty at the very beginning that it's just hard to get through. And like that's the only thing that these books are about, like everything centered around that. But that's not the case for this. Like, yes, they do talk very, very like spicy to each other. And there's a lot of like dirty, dirty language and like is is a very spicy series but they don't actually do it until like halfway through and so it it gives you kind of like it gets you into the mindset it gets you into the the environment who these characters are what their situations are and there it's a lot of action in these books which I love there is like never a dull moment in these books And so it just keeps the story progressing and then you're progressing with these characters and the relationships and it's just like good girl, bad guy and you just see how the the dynamics work and it just, it works and I just have become obsessed with it. And so let's get into this first book. The first book is called Ruthless Creatures and it's about Cage and Natalie and Natalie is with her best friend Sloane and Sloane's book is the second book um, like about her story but her and her best friend they are at this bar and they see Cage for the first time and he turns them down he's like this beautiful hot guy Sloane is a very confident person he turns her down and then Natalie kind of goes for it and he turns her down and that's like unheard of but Natalie she had a fiance five years ago that he disappeared like the day before they, they, were, they were supposed to get married. And so she's still kind of depressed about it. She's still kind, not really stuck, but kind of, you know, I don't stuck is kind of like an abrupt word, but she's still heartbroken about it. And so Sloan understands he she like 
tries to help her. And so she's like, let's go to the bar. Okay. So he like turns him down and everything. It turns out that he cage is actually her new neighbor and he's very forward from the very beginning. So he like turns her down and then she starts to see him throughout like the week, like in the different places. And she's like, um, okay. And he actually shows up at her house and is very forward and is like, do you want this? Because I'm obsessed with you basically. And she's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Like I am still having a hard time with like my fiance. Like we're pretty sure he's dead. And he's like, okay, you just call me. And so he like, she kind of knows who or what he is. He tells her that he's like a debt collector for like bad guys. And then she pretty much guesses that he's like in this mafia. Like he's in the top of the Russian mafia. And so she has his number, but she doesn't call. And so he kind of disappears for a little bit. And then he shows up again. And I think they get spicy or like he's just very open with her. Like, hey, I'm not really supposed to have a relationship, but I I just can't stop thinking about you. I want to be with you. Like, yeah, he's just he's just automatically obsessed. And um, later on, so they spend time together, like he flies in and out. He is kind of based in like New York, but he flies in and out ever so often to come see her like a couple times a month. And they just like are obsessed with each other and having a lot of, you know, sex. And um, there comes a time that we find out that... Um, he was supposed to go on this assignment, um, to kill her. Um, he, the top boss, he says, go kill her. We find out why in a little bit. And he just couldn't do it. Like he just became like enamored by her. And so he's keeping a secret from his boss. His boss is actually in prison and, but of course they know everything, you know, like the mob finds out everything. And so he comes back and forth. Um, There is a knock on her door like a while later, you know, Um, and it is from a guy that used to own the building of where her fiance David lived at. He's like, hey, we were renovating and we found this envelope stuck in like the little drop box, box, like mailbox. And it's for you. And it's like titled to her and she was supposed to get it like the day of their wedding. And there is actually a key and a letter in there. And the next time Cage comes around, he sees the key and he's like, oh, that's for a lockbox. Actually, no, it wasn't Cage. It was one of the this guy that is part of like the sheriff's office and she had broken up with him like the day before she met Cage and he's just kind of been like a a weirdo. So he's like, oh yeah, this is actually like for a lockbox. And so she is able to go and find this lockbox and there's this long letter to her. She doesn't think anything of it. And then um, somehow the main mob boss finds out that she's alive and so he sends an assassin for her and cage shows up right then and kills the assassin she is able to i think he's getting rid of the body and she like is able to decipher this letter that david sent her and knows that he like is telling her the secret message and actually before let's see before i think before before she learns that, um, she learns that, like, obviously the mob boss wanted her dead. And so Cage tells her, and this is kind of where, like, spoilers happen. So if you don't want to know, like, why the mob boss had an assassin after her, then skip ahead because you're you're going to find out now. So basically, they figure out or Cage tells her the reason why he was after her is because David used to be their accountant for the the Russian mob and he was stealing all this money and they didn't know. And so he created this whole like case against them, like with the FBI to be able to get the mob boss into prison. And so he actually went into the witness protection program and that's where he found Natalie. 
yeah, and so he left. Um, I guess they found out about him or, or his cover was blown. And so the FBI took him like the day before the wedding and he sent that letter with all this encryption so that she would know to go to Panama, but the letter got stuck and so she never got it. And so when Cage, like fast forward to real time now, when Cage is getting rid of the body, she discovers what that meant and it was to go to Panama. So she gets on a plane, goes to Panama, Panama goes to this address and he's there David is alive he's there and she's like so mad at him and he's like what took you like five years and she's like oh wow like uh I was in a depressive state it got stuck like you didn't tell me all these things like also we had found out that when he was in the mob he had a wife and kids Like, and she didn't say anything. He didn't say anything, like nothing. So the wife and kids thinks that he's dead. So she's like mad about that. And then Cage finds her, of course, because he always finds her. And he's like, come on, like, I'm sorry. I didn't tell you, like, I love you. Like, let's leave. And she's like, fine, like we're leaving. And I guess um, David's new wife shows up. And she's like, what is this? And Natalie's like, oh, how long did you wait before this one? And he says a year. And it's like, oh, my gosh. So he's done. Whatever. I forgot to say when she wanted to go on a date. So Sloan wanted to go on a double date with Cage and Natalie because with like her fling. And I think I said that earlier. Um, But when they were there, um, some... Irish mobsters were there and they like kind of slapped Sloan's butt and so her fling got all up in their face there was a shootout um the two guys that were with Sloan's fling they died they actually I think were shooting the Irish mobsters too Cage comes in shoots the Irish mobsters they're like boom okay done but it turns out that actually started a war Uh, with the two mobs and so that's when we get to the second book and sorry if I'm going all over the place I apologize Um, I'm just trying to keep it straight which which part is in which book like I wrote all my notes but I was also getting confused as well (laughs) like what when what when things happened and in what parts so it all comes together. Like there's so many other things that happen as well, like behind the scenes, but I'm just giving you kind of like the main portion. So you know, kind of what you're getting into. So now we get into carnal urges, which is Sloan because there was this little war that kind of started with the Irish and the Russians at the very end Sloan gets kidnapped by the Irish. So she gets kidnapped by the second, the, the second higher up guy, Declan. And while she's there with him, honestly, their first interaction, he gets a call to let him know that the top guy, Diego, is dead. And he is now the top guy. And like I said earlier, this second book is my favorite because Sloan she is so funny, like so funny, so confident, so witty, so positive, like she can win anyone over. And I loved her. She's my favorite. Natalie was fine. Like the banter and the wittiness in the first book was very great. I really liked it. It had its funny moments, but I loved Sloan. Like she just was so I just loved her. Like she was just such a great character. And again, all these behind the things that are happening. The one thing that I had a hard time with this book is there was more BDSM. There was a little bit in the first book and I just kind of like skipped through it, but it was a main factor in the relationship in the sex in this book that I did have to skip quite a bit there is a lot more sex in this book I will say and a lot more spicier but all these books actually the first two books I would say they're like a five out of five spicy well I mean yeah like a 4.55 I have read other books that are way more descriptive that are very spicy these ones are descriptive but like 
I don't know. I don't know how to describe it. It It's just like they're all so spicy. So just be aware of that. But there is a lot more BDSM like every scene. There also is a scene that I had a problem with that she's on her period and he's like, oh, whatever. And so he just pops her tampon out. And I'm just like, oh, that's... I mean... I understand it, like how it was described. Like, I know I cringe and I'm like, ooh, but I'm like, I'm not yucking anyone's yum because it was explained in there that these mobsters, they see so much blood every single day and killing that period blood is nothing to them. And I was in my head, I was like, oh my gosh, that actually makes a lot of sense. And me cringing because like we don't see a lot of blood, you know, every day, but they do. And so it's like literally nothing. It's like just another day for them. And and you know what? The These books have taught me even more to not yuck someone's yum because a lot of people like that, which is fine. It's just not what gets me off. You know what I'm saying? So I had to kind of like work through that process in my book or in my head while I was reading this book. Like, it's okay. It's fine. Like, whatever. It gets them off. It it gets them going. It gets other people going. And that's okay. Um, I, I really like the characters. I really like the plot. That's why I'm still going to keep going. So... It is frustrating, again, um, which it happened in the first book, it happened again in this book, that we don't find out a lot about Sloane and Declan until three-fourths of the way through. Like, about them as people, like their backgrounds. Like, we really don't. Like... Sloane, she, I guess, was like a, a fat kid when she was young. She was sent to fat camp. Um, she, Her parents would shame her. She was molested by a family friend and had like a, a teenage pregnancy. But um, she had some bullies and one of the bullies like pushed her down the stairs and she like miscarried. I think at like 13 or 14, like she has had a hard growing up. And, um, her mom died when she was younger. Um, I think around that same time, uh, from ovarian cancer. And so she was raised a lot by her dad and this family friend that was there for a year. And so she, uh, she went through a lot and she has grown into a great person and has just very strong standards and who, and knows who she is. Um, and then there's Declan, like he's had a hard life as well. Like his parents were caught in the crossfire of a shootout at like a cafe and his older brother died in an explosion at a pub and his younger brother was killed in a collision with like a driver, um, that was like hit by like the IRA members on their way to blow up a bank. And, and then his sister was at a nightclub that was set on fire by the gang who wanted to intimidate its owner into paying protection. Like he had no one left and that's the same for cage too like his parents were killed from the mob and his siblings were like his two sisters and it just they have had hard lives that it's understandable that they are in this hard life as well because that's what they're used to they they gravitate towards like uh, an organization or kind of a, a made family you know and so Declan, going back to Declan, he had no one left, so he actually joined the military. And then from there, he was recruited to kind of the military intelligence, so like Ireland's version of the CIA. And then he had like this family priest who immigrated to the States before his parents died. He actually contacted Declan and said like, hey, I heard of your reputation. I've made some contacts here. Like it might be useful. Like, why don't you come over here? And so he did. And he joined the mob and worked his way up. And so now he's like the top like head boss. And this is where some spoilers are going to come in because, again, there was this big twist at the end that if you don't want to know, I completely understand, just skip ahead starting now. So the spoiler is that he is actually a double agent. So he is high up in the Irish mob and he has been for over 20 years and he's actually been working for our government as well for the past 20 years as a spy. 
And so he's helping the mob while also helping our government. And he's also a double agent working for the Irish government. So in a sense, he's working for the Irish government, telling them about the U.S. government and about the Irish mob, telling them all about that. He's also telling the U.S. government about the Irish mob. And he's not really telling the the mob about the government, but having those contacts helps him in the mob. So he's been the spy for 20 years. And of course, him and Cage hate each other because they're both top dogs in their respective mobs, you know, the Russian mob and the Irish mob. And so having their girlfriends be best friends, like absolutely best friends and these are two sworn enemies it's kind of created this like I don't know like you like both of them as individuals and you want them to become like friends or you want them to become allies but they're not and so it just like twists about like them having an assassin go after the other one and it's just like you're you're caught in this in the middle that it's like I just want everyone to get along like why can't you get along and so at one point um so yeah now or Sloan is kidnapped at the beginning her and Declan fall in love throughout the date like again he just becomes obsessed with her and she very much is like no I have never had any attachment to boyfriends like I don't know about this it's just like a dessert you know like I've had my dessert I'm done never had that and so it was new for her to open her eyes to relationships and like he treats her well lots of BDSM type stuff and and having that trust and he lets her know about it's like later on that he lets her know about being you know this agent and so they work through that and then at one point she is kidnapped by the U.S. government to see if she can be trusted because she's kind of this asset now and they want to know if like she would give Declan up and so we go through that and then yeah they are also trying to protect themselves from these other mobs and it's just kind of this full circle thing that I'm like oh my gosh like I can't. And so at the very end, I thought this cliffhanger would be the intro to the third book, but it actually wasn't. Um, So we find out at the end of the second book that the former boss of the Irish mob, remember how um, Declan got that call saying that he's like the new boss because the, the regular boss, like he was dead. He's actually not dead. And his name is Diego. He's the former boss. And Cage actually has him in this warehouse in a cage, go figure, and um, has had them there for a while and has actually been like trying to get him to spill all the secrets, do all that. And so he's alive. And so I thought that was going to come into play in this third book. And so far, it really hasn't. Like they mention it and there's a couple scenes with this Diego and like the warehouse gets on fire and he says he has amnesia, but really he doesn't. He just wants to get out of like the mob lifestyle. Like he just wants out. And so I think Cage is going to like help him get out of that. Um, But the third book is actually about Sloane's sister, Riley, and it's called Savage Hearts. And we, I don't think we hear about it in the second book at all. So on the third book, Cage actually works with this assassin and his name is Malik and he works for the actual Russian mob king like the Russian mob in Russia the king of the mob like it's his right hand man and so Cage is like hey um Declan killed your brother and so do with that what you will like you can try and kill him he's just basically said like you can kill him don't kill his girl because my girl and his girl are best friends like don't touch the females but you can kill him and so then you're like oh my gosh no like you can't kill him and so they 
send for Riley at the very beginning because Sloan is like, hey, I'm going to get married. Like, I want to spend time with you. They hadn't seen each other in three years. They kind of had this falling out. And so, uh, and so Riley's like, oh, okay, that's fine. And so they fly her out to Bermuda, I think. And she sees this mallet guy and he sees her and he just kind of is enamored by her he's like who is this female she looks like he thinks actually that she is a hired sex worker of Declan and Sloan's and so he's like I gotta get her out of there like she looks like a nice girl like I I need to get her out of there and so he actually like they call him ghost because he literally is the best assassin like in the world like nobody can ever like hear when he's there he's able to slip in and out of everywhere like so he actually meets so he actually meets her in this bathroom and gives her like this envelope of like a hundred thousand dollars and he's like I'm gonna help you get out like how can I help you? And she's like, whoa, what? And he like disappears. And nobody knows that he was there. And so she is there, of course, with like all the the Irish mob bodyguards and everything like that. And her sister like doesn't believe her that there was this guy in the bathroom. And her sister and Declan, they have to leave. And so Riley is stuck at this Barmuda house and this mallet guy comes in again and he just is like I don't know why I'm obsessed with you like why didn't you leave and she's like well because I'm not the sex worker like I am Declan's future sister-in-law and he's like oh and so he gets like mad about it and he is still like not killing her and so she like tells these bodyguards like hey uh this guy like has kept approaching me his name's Malik and they're like oh shit like (gasps) Malik like the ghost and so they take her to the safe house and it's like a secure safe house like underground everything Malik is still able to get in and he like is just obsessed with her still and they like kiss and they get kind of hot and heavy and that's when one of the bodyguards comes in and he's like starts shooting and Malik shoots him and then another bodyguard comes in and she Riley gets in the way like she's like no stop and the bodyguard actually shoots her and so Malik shoots the other bodyguard and or no he doesn't shoot him he like knocks him out because the bodyguard's like stunned like oh my gosh I just shot this girl like I don't know what I'm supposed to do and so Malik actually takes her um up through Canada he takes her to the hospital of course like a nondescriptive hospital like secret hospital uh she loses like I think she loses a kidney she loses her gallbladder and she lost like two liters of blood or something and so she's just been in and out of like this coma and so he takes her up through Canada and she wakes up and she's in Moscow like he has taken her to Russia and so yeah I'm 60% the way through this book and they did just have sex but there was no description like there was nothing like they got hot and heavy but then that was it like It was kind of a fade to black almost. And I was surprised. I was like, wait, what? Like I was expecting something else. Like this is kind of a Romeo and Juliet type thing. And I was expecting like this big thing because he's been caring for her while she's been recovering. And it's like very cute and nice. And he's showing the sensitive side. And so I was like, okay, yeah, like I'm ready for this. And then there was nothing like I was kind of disappointed to be honest and so but I mean of course I'm not done with the book and like she is just like Sloane I like Riley a lot like she's a little bit more toned down from Sloane with like the the wittiness and the banter but she's still she's quick she's funny she's like she's this little girl from San Francisco she is an editor and like she is just this free loving kind of hippie girl like I just really really like her as well and so I'm excited to keep reading like I I don't know how but these books I just have loved I really have it has 
pulled me so many ways where I'm like, I shouldn't like this book. Like, this is a dark romance. But then I'm like, no, I really like these characters. So I guess that shows to you, like, I can read a dark romance. I can probably even read, like, a reverse harem. It honestly depends on the writing, the writing style, the characters, the storyline. I think that's honestly what it depends on. Because, like, I haven't minded the darkness of like the mafia and the shooting and the killing and even the BDSM. I just kind of like skip through it. Like I I skim it and I haven't minded it. It's crazy. Like I I think I made a big discovery, you know? Um, But yeah, so I honestly, if you like a dark romance or just like a spicy mafia book, I highly recommend you pick up this series because like, I am going to finish this book tonight and I will most likely start on the fourth fourth book. I don't know what the fourth book is going to be about. I hope it's another character. I don't know if it's just going to be a wrap up of all three of these characters. I don't know, but I'm excited to find out. And that's saying something. So JT Gessinger, if that's how you say your last name, you've got it. You have another fan. I am here for this. And I do see that she has other books. And so am I going to pick them up? Yeah, most likely. Am I going to read them before my current TBR? Uh, Yeah, probably. Uh, Probably, actually. (laughs) Like, I am loving this mobster world. Like, it's very fascinating. So anyways, thanks for joining me for another episode. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope it made sense. And I just, I, again, I highly recommend you pick up at least the first book and kind of get a sense of who they are and then pick up the second book. Because honestly, if I could rank them so far, I would rank it number two, number three, and then number one. Because I like number one, but I like the characters in the two and three better. And so that's kind of how you know. I don't, but they're not one off. Like you have to read the first one to know really what's going on in the second and third, which sucks. But again, they're not, the first one's not bad. It's, it's really good. Um, But it just, yeah, I like the other ones better. So anyways, thanks for joining on my little rambling of all of these three books. I'm excited for the fourth book. And um, wherever you're listening to this episode, if you could rate and review, that definitely helps me out a lot. And then follow me on Instagram and TikTok. It's just find me in a book podcast. But anyways, thanks again for joining me and I will talk to you next week.